welcome back to the Health Hunt podcast. Today I am joined by the lovely Kira O'Connor. Hello, Kira. Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming on. Um, Kira, I would have discovered through you would have been Saz's client. Yes. Um, yeah, and I would have absolutely just loved your honesty and your vulnerability online. So, like, every, anyone that follows Kira will know that like, she'll just look at her stories and she'll just be sharing bits and bobs of her day every day and just offering so much value um, along the way, along her journey. And um, so, we're going to chat a little bit about that. But, do you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do? The question everyone hates. <laughs> yes, yeah, just last night, I was like, I absolutely hate this question. Um, <laughs> farmer, I, I, it must be like a a thing about myself because it's nobody else like it's just a question but it definitely is something got to do with me not feeling like comfortable to be like yeah I actually do this and be proud of it it's like you know when you think you can't take a compliment yeah that me. so that's probably why I feel so uncomfortable with it but hello my name is um Kira O'Connor I've actually done a lot of speaking this year and you'd think that I wouldn't be nervous by now but I'm still nervous <laughs> um so what do I do? I am an online coach. Um, I work primarily with people who obviously are looking to improve their relationship with food or who are in like similar, a similar boat to where I was once at. Um, I don't deal with obviously specifically eating disorders as such. Um, I kind of refer out depending on obviously the circumstances and stuff like that, but that's referred out. Um, but mainly people who have like disordered eating kind of think of food as good and bad um want to stop feeling guilty about food and stuff like that um so yeah that's kind of my main focus at the moment is just helping people through that amazing and is that training and nutrition yeah so training and nutrition sorry I'm not really selling myself here am I? <laughs> <laughs> you're all right <laughs> um yeah so what I do is I'll work alongside obviously I have a lot of fat loss clients as well so it's not just I'm solely shutting myself off and just working with people who want to work in the relationship with food it's more so obviously people who just want to achieve fat loss just want to feel good in their se- in their skin and stuff like that so yeah it's training it's nutrition um but it's mainly kind of focusing on even if even if a fat loss client comes to me and they you know they want to work on fat loss or whatever we mainly focus on actually their lifestyle and their behaviors and everything else before we kind of focus on the fat loss itself because if you change your behaviors your body is just a, basically a byproduct of your lifestyle. So yeah, I'm kind of like holistic, a holistic approach, basically. Is we love I... the holistics. Yes, <laughs> we do. No, yeah. that's, that's such a nice way to think um, that I suppose you're, I suppose when people kind of look at diet first, fat loss first, weight loss first, they mm. miss the kind of forest for the trees and they're only focused on that. They're only looking at it through that lens. They're not yeah. actually looking at health at all. But when you prioritize your health first, you can have fat loss, you can have weight loss and you can not feel like shit along the way as well. Um, <laughs> oh, you me. mentioned, oh, sorry, go on. No, go for it, go for it. Um, you mentioned, I suppose, your journey with an eating disorder. Um, do you want to talk us through that a little bit? Of course. Um, so I, I'm going to go back to probably, I suppose, when it all kicked off. I will kind of speed it up because like, I don't want to ram, ram on about my journey for so long. But um, it kind of all started uh, when I was 16. And it was mainly what everybody else wants is just to go into the gym, is to get skinny, is to feel like people are going to like them more if they're skinny or that boys are going to like them more if they're skinny. And it's obviously it's just not the case. Now, I can see that now because I've gone through it. But yeah, the main driver behind me, obviously, starting the gym and looking at my food and stuff like that was purely just to be skinny. Um, There was no like, I want to lift weights. There was nothing like that. And I think all girls can relate to that. They just go into the gym and they're like, cardio, cardio, cardio. <laughs> and sometimes I don't know about you but being in the industry you forget that people still think like that because I've worked like you know I'm I've come so far and I forget that I have this knowledge because I went through it but I like when I still pe- speak to people on a day-to-day basis when they say things like that I'm like wow this is still like this is still a thing and it yeah. still happens um so yeah that was obviously the main reason for going to the gym but obviously when I got into it it was just pure cardio like I I think I was doing like two hours on the stairmaster, like which is absolutely insane. Like that's that torture. Is, that's like punishment. <laughs> um. So yeah, like two hours on two hours on the stairmaster. Um. And I wasn't really looking at my food at this point. 
then it got to a point where I was doing like mad kind of like you know challenges where you'd be like oh I'll cut out fizzy drinks I'll cut out like you know chips or anything quote unquote bad um so cut those all out and that was actually the first time that I actually started seeing a bit of results so of course when you see results and you're after cutting out all of the bad foods of course you just tie two of them together and it's like oh my god the best way to lose weight is obviously to quit out the bad food because that's how I'm after getting here. Obviously. So I, obviously, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Um, so I kept doing that. Obviously, cut out everything that I probably would have considered bad or, you know, in my household was considered bad. And it was like I didn't even actually notice it happening. It was like at the start, I was actually happy with cutting the foods out and, you know, not having the 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 not so great foods. And I didn't even actually see the weight come off me, but it was like one day, you know, when you're doc- documenting your process, you're like taking pictures or whatever. I remember one day waking up and took I took a picture and I was like, holy shit, I look lean. And like, this was genuine, I genuinely had such a smile on my face. Like I was buzzing with this. There was no, there was no even doubts in my head. I didn't actually realize what was really going on. So I was buzzing at the fact that I had lost so much weight. I was like, this is fantastic. This is all I've ever wanted. And thinking that I was going to get like some sort of like external validation off people. But it, I didn't get any of that. The only thing that I really got from people was like, oh my God, you're so motivated, like blah, blah, blah. But then it got to a point where I just kept losing and losing and losing. And I actually loved being lean, but it never brought me what I thought it was going to bring me. So it never brought me the attention. It never brought me the love off other people. If anything, it made certain people in my life feel insecure in themselves because I was after getting so lean and so skinny and they were feeling insecure in themselves yet I was like really really struggling with food at this point then you know so I couldn't have anything I couldn't go out and socialize like any of my friends couldn't understand why I kept saying no to go out and socialize and I got to a point then because I was after tying like food and losing weight together like I'm making that equation in my head that like, okay, this food equals weight loss and you'll keep the weight off if you just keep eating these foods. So now all of a sudden I'm in this amazing routine that's just involved with certain amount of food, going to the gym and that's my life, you know? And I'm like 16, 17, like probably when you should be going out and living your life a little bit. Um, but instead, <laughs> yeah, literally on the desk or something. Instead, I was like, no, can't go out, can't do any of that. Um, and I was just living basically in the gym but because at the time I loved this so much like as in being lean even though deep down I knew that there was issues with food like I couldn't have certain things if I had certain things like I'd have to go out and run it off um and I I don't know it just was like nothing that nothing that I'd done gave me what I wanted so that love or that like appreciation or that like validation that I was looking off other people and looking outside of myself I never actually got that um so yeah obviously we stay I think I've maintained that somehow I maintained that for a long period of time I think I would have maintained the the leanness for about a year and then you start to break down like I personally think that there's only so long you can last with such severe restriction you know so it's you're bound to break at some point so when my friends used to be then like if they come over they they'd know by now you know when you say no enough times that they just stop asking you so yeah if they were ever with me or they were getting takeaways or stuff like that I'd never obviously get them and I, I'd act like I was absolutely fine with that like I don't want any of this like you know and I remember like sitting there being like like how do they just leave food like how do you just leave food on your plate and obviously I hadn't had any sort of takeaways hadn't had a taste of takeaways whatsoever and I remember one specific night they actually left food over and I remember them leaving the house and I I swear to God, Arla, I could not control myself, like could not. It was like one of the first time that I had experienced a binge with no control, like complete loss of control, ate everything to the point that like, you know, when you're so bloated that like your stomach is literally like nearly touching the roof. That was me. <laughs> that was me, like on my stomach was so hard because I had ate so much food in the space of 10 minutes and I suppose that's what you'd obviously describe a binge overeating and obviously binging are two completely different things so me binging looked like somebody else is it felt like somebody else was in my body doing that action and that the 
the like the overeating is like you make a conscious decision whereas binging is like okay I couldn't control it I felt like I couldn't stop it I also then ate so much like you know you could I don't know we won't put a number on it but you eat so much um food in the short space of time basically then obviously you're filled with like shame guilt and that was exactly what I was filled with so I remember the next day I just got up and ran a 10k and was like this will be grand you know you have in your head because I I knew that calories you know burned essentially kind of burned fat or whatever in my head that's what it was like so it was like oh well if I just go out and run a 10k all the food that I ate last night and the fact that I experienced the binge doesn't even matter so completely like ignored myself ignored my feelings about my body ignored like every sort of cue that my body could have given to me I ignored it you know and I went out and despite that obviously put it through punishment and most people would think like oh like you know it's not that big of a punishment but like it is when you're severely restricted and then you're forcing yourself to go out on a run the next day you know even though everything in your body is telling you not to go out for that run you don't even listen to it so that was when the whole like I suppose it the leanness the eating disorder kind of started to break down a little bit and it started to show me that there was an actual real issue you know like when you feel like you have to go out and run any sort of food that you have off um I think that's like a tell tail sign and that's the that's the sentence just a little bit just yeah a little just bit. a little bit um just a red flag kind of but <laughs> yeah so I remember obviously you know I had no energy no drive no motivation and it was more like people were like you're so motivated you know you just keep going to the gym but like that to me was not like motivated it was more of an obsession but like an obsession where you had to do it you know if anybody has ever went to the gym because they have to do it you know that you don't really enjoy it that much you're only going because I was only going because it was like but I can't lose my image now I was like my identity is lean I'm like I'm so skinny I'm absolutely ripped all of the time and everybody knows me as that girl you know Mm -hmm. so I was like I can't possibly lose that so I think when you create an identity around being lean it's very hard then for people to cope with putting on weight and that was exactly what happened to me um but I remember one night um sorry just to obviously explain how how I actually knew I had an eating disorder of course there was a lot of red flags of what I'm actually after speaking about but I remember one night then I just I, I literally like obviously my family and stuff were super super worried about me but I feel like there's not not that there's not much you can do in that circumstance but if somebody's in denial the way I was and the way I just didn't care like if if people told me that I was skinny I kind of got a buzz off it even though I was severely in my own head like kind of fucked up with food you know so um yeah I remember one night my mom was just like oh like are you okay or whatever and like you know when someone asks you are you okay and you're just not and you're like the lump is in your throat (laughs) (laughs) bawling um literally bawling within seconds so yeah I just broke down and I was like look I I can't eat anything anything that I eat I feel like I have to run off um and that was when obviously we decided we'd go to the doctor blah 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 but like I had lost then obviously my cycle at this point so I know this seems a little bit all over the place the story that I'm telling um but obviously true getting so so lean my body was just in fire or flight mode um as you probably know yourself so it was yeah it was just like I had no cycle but like back then it's like oh well this is great <laughs> I don't have to deal with a period I love that I'm 17 yeah. don't like having a period um so I didn't actually it was exactly the same as being lean I didn't care that everybody thought I was getting skinny I didn't care that I didn't have a period because I was so naive I didn't have any idea obviously I wasn't a coach at this point <laughs> but I didn't have any idea that I you know the consequences of losing your period so when we obviously went to the doctor she was asking those questions about obviously being off there or not having your cycle then I was obviously describing the whole eating scenario. She referred me out to Jigsaw um, to obviously cope with the food and to deal with the eating disorder and stuff like that. And she was the one who actually told me I had an eating disorder. It wasn't that I just diagnosed myself. Um, so yeah, that was when I they tried to obviously start me on therapy um, through obviously Jigsaw. Jigsaw then was not a vibe. They were like trying to take the control away from me and I was still in denial although I had admitted it I wasn't I didn't want to fix it like I didn't want to work on it at all because I was like 
well what's the real pain because i'm like i'm lean i'm eating you know like i don't really want to fix this um but yeah so i kind of went to jigsaw like once or twice and i was like this therapy is not for me dropped out <laughs> i was like i'm not doing this and continued on with it even though i knew i had an issue you know so you can have lots of issues in life and continue with them and decide that the cost of it is not actually that pricey that you're willing to pay the price basically so I was willing to pay the price of losing my cycle you know not being able to go out and socialize you know not being able to eat because my routine and being in the gym and being in control of my food and my body image was way too important to me so Mm. yeah I wasn't willing to change that um so I think then I started to break down obviously when I described the binging so like I said restriction can only last for so long and then I obviously started to experience binging but it was like you know like once every month or free not that frequent basically um but the only reason it wasn't that frequent was because every time I went back to normal routine or normal foods it helped me you know that helped like being in my routine helped me stay on quote-unquote track whereas like most people even if you don't have the severe end of what I'm talking about most people when they come out of their routine they struggle like and they struggle so much with even having food out or you know having drinks and stuff like that so I just never took myself out of my routine I never changed it never wanted to change it so that was only the reason I was able to cope with still having frequent binges still restricting my food you know still counting on my fitness pal still going to the gym was just purely out of routine and obsession with being lean but um Sorry, I wanted to kind of backtrack there and just talk about obviously <laughs> losing losing my cycle. But yeah, so losing my cycle in the midst of all this binging, I know it seems like a blur probably right now, but I suppose as we go on, it will make sense. Um, so obviously then when I was lost my cycle and the doctors or whatever knew about it, they were just like, we'll just put you on the pill because you know that'll give you your period back, you'll be fine. I was never ever once told you know, that the pill is actually a fake bleed. And I don't even think what the bizarre thing is, is that like my parents wouldn't be like my mom wouldn't be educated. You know, she doesn't come from an educational background, so she has no idea. She's just like, yeah, whatever. Same as my sister, you know, so in a sense, there was no one there looking out for me, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Even though they were trying to, they had no clue, obviously, what was going on. They've never, ever had to deal with somebody having an eating disorder or having like, you know, losing a period or whatever. So yeah, I was just like, okay, yeah, I'll go on the pill, you know, like literally had no idea what I was getting myself into. So put myself on the pill. Um, but it was only through my own research. I remember so vividly listening to a podcast and I think it was a doctor, some woman doctor and anyways was talking about basically that your your pill is just a fake lead. I was like, oh my God, like they lied to me. <laughs> I got <laughs> period. I like, I have no period right now. Um so this is obviously a while later when I actually started to educate myself was like in around the binging and then being on the pill at the same time I obviously started to like okay I think I have an interest you know like we all do I think I have an interest in fitness because I'm so lean um and I want to help people be lean (laughs) um so yeah I started to educate myself and that's when I found out about the obviously the pill and you know it being an actual fake bleed so I actually took the decision to take myself off the pill so I didn't actually go to anyone. I just completely stopped taking it. I was like, nope, we're actually going to see if I have a cycle. Um, so I still didn't have a cycle for a couple of months. Um, but this was in and around kind of when the binging was still going on. So when I got to college then, so this is probably when I'm 18, I'm starting college. So the eating disorder and the lean and the, the little bit of binging going on, that went on for about two years. Then we got into college and then my routine completely changed. So as you can imagine, when your routine completely changed, I just didn't know how to cope with it, basically. So I was so busy. I was doing, I think I was doing a PT course at the same time that I started college. So I was doing that in the evenings and I was just so overwhelmed and I didn't know how to cope with my feelings at all. Like, as you can tell, you know, I ignored every sort, every sign that my body gives to me, I ignored. So I took on so much probably to just escape the feelings of the fact that I was I was slightly binging and stuff like that but the more I took on the more that I turned to food and the more that I used food then to cope with 
the fact that my body was starting to change because I was having these frequent binges. So it didn't matter how, how much I went out and ran it off. Like you cannot outrun binges. You cannot, you know, you can't, no amount of cardio is, is going to save you from that. The only thing that will save you is working on your relationship with food. But obviously I didn't know that. So I just kept going in this circle of binging and then, you know, doing an hour of cardio the next morning and going to the gym again, like, you know, going to the gym twice a day and stuff purely to escape the fact that I was binging so much. So yeah, when I got into college, that was obviously when it all changed. The binges then turned into not just once a month or, you know, once every two weeks, it literally turned into every single day. Every single day I couldn't stop, I couldn't stop eating. And it was a repetitive cycle that I actually didn't know it was a cycle. Like I was that clueless to what was going on that I had no idea genuinely how to stop it. So I was like, I, you'll see it a lot is that people are like, the reason I'm overeating or the reason I have this issue with food is because of my body image. So the more that I seen my body image change and my body slightly get bigger, you know, and going from this lean girl to, you know, this bigger girl or to the old version of me, the more I binged. So people think that fat loss is going to, you know, kind of fix the relationship with food. And I do get to a certain extent that people want to feel comfortable in themselves. But like, or if you had a came to me back then and tried to diet me, I couldn't, I, you, I, I wouldn't have been able to do that because I, I actually tried that. I went to a coach and I was like, diet me, please, because I just keep, I can't control myself around food. Okay. And the more, like, there's a time and a place, but obviously for me, the severe end of things that I was at, I could, you, you couldn't have, you, I, there was no way that I was dying. No matter how much I tried, no matter if you put me on a meal plan or you didn't put me on a meal plan, there was no way that I could tr- control myself around food. So the more that it, obviously my body started to change was when I went to this coach and was like, please just, you know, I need to do something about this. Put me on a diet. That only lasted probably about a month, if even, but like, I was lying in the midst of that, you know, so I was lying to him. I was lying, saying that I was doing everything that he had asked me to do and just kept putting on more and more weight. Um, And then I think I, I I took a break and then I think I went back to him again, just, you know, because like, why not try it for a second time and try and, you know, stop binging. And so went back a second time, was able, this was in the round, sorry, I'm losing you as in time wise, but so that was in 2019 um, and then obviously lockdown hit in 2020. So I went back to him in when COVID hit. So in the March of 2020 and was basically like, okay, you know, everything had calmed down. I was a qualified coach at this point. I was obviously still severely deep, like dealing with my body image and, you know, being in a bigger body and stuff like that. Um, and just wanted to lose the weight because I was like, if I lose the weight, that will fix how I'm feeling about myself and that will fix my relationship with food. So because lockdown had hit and everything was so calm and I had my own routine, we didn't have to leave our house. It was great. Like, because I got my routine back, I got the control back. I didn't have to, you know, do 101 things at once. And yeah, so I think I lost a bit of weight up until the June. So March to June, and then it was my birthday. And when, like people will, if people have ever obviously experienced overeating or binging or whatever, they'll know that like once you get a taste of it it, it's almost like then you can't stop so the minute I got a taste of that bad food at my birthday that was it then the diet was done the meal plan was done I couldn't stick to it anymore and I just kept binging but the funny thing even about that was like still didn't see it not that I didn't see it as a red flag of course I knew it was an issue and then on top of that I was like wanting to coach people and I was having severe kind of like what am I even doing with myself like how can I coach people if I'm struggling with my relationship with food you know now at this point I obviously wasn't in any way shape or form dealing with anybody with the relationship with food I was just dealing with people who wants to lose um lose some weight or whatever and yeah so I was obviously having imposter syndrome on top of the binging and then I stayed with that coach literally for I'd say about a year or before I actually decided that I needed to do something so that took me from 2017 to 2020, 21 to actually decide that I wanted to work on my relationship with food. So that, yeah, 
it's like you're uh, constantly constantly seeking that control the whole time yes. afraid to let go afraid to release um mm-hmm. and it's like it's almost like you had moments of evidence along the way to not trust yourself because you lapsed and you were binging yeah. when it was birthdays and stuff like that um but you you mentioned actually at the start that you're not very good at remembering the bits but i think you're really good i think you're like you're able to give mm-hmm. those kind of examples and like even your tiktok and all is brilliant um and you're like i feel like i've kind of blacked out some of that sometimes yeah. um because not blacked out but i think well like you said at the start as well i kind of a bit more far removed from it because it's not something that i've suffered with in years you know that kind of way yeah um, but was there a point that you were like i'm gonna change this like for my health or i'm gonna change this because um people in my life don't want me to be like this anymore or what was that kind of deciding moment for you um like with, where i suppose with regards to like the binging aspect yeah, I suppose deciding to release the control, release the dieting and move forward and try to heal your relationship with food. Um, I, I I think the the like I think if I didn't become a coach, I think I could have suffered a lot longer. Okay. You know? But I think becoming a coach and then at one point, like when the when the binge in, when I first got into college and the binge in first started, I remember thinking to myself, so that was twenty nineteen and I remember being in such a low place that I genuinely was this sounds so extreme but like when you're you know when you're hiding in the bathroom having to eat your food you know and binging in the bathroom and like doing bizarre things like that I just felt at such a low point that I was like like what like, what am I even here for I was like because I can't fucking control my food I was like I'm getting bigger as the day goes on I was like I, I just want to be lean again and that's what most people will deal with is that they want to when they get into a bigger body they're constantly comparing themselves to their old self when they look super lean and they're like I just want to go back there and the funny thing is is that I was willing to take any sort of restriction to just get back there because being out of control was so much more worse like was so that doesn't even make sense it was so worse than (laughs) actually being in control so back then in my head it was like okay let's you know I, I need to get back to just being in control again um so yeah I was obviously doubting my entire existence doubting my life and I don't mean that in like you know in time of month like you know where you're just doubting your life like I was genuinely doubting my life and I remember going to um I actually was like no I really need to I went back to the doctor because I decided I'd I'd actually needed to fix this and um the doctor obviously referred me out to another kind of like um another therapist basically so this is like what two years down the line or a year down the line of referring me to jigsaw um so when I obviously got on this was back I didn't get an appointment sorry until the March when everything closed and I remember being on the phone and he was like he was just like yeah so we're like we're gonna put you on antidepressants because everything that you're describing sounds to me like you're depressed (laughs) And I was like, I'm 19 at this time. And I was like, honey, I know I'm not depressed. I was like, I'm far from depressed. I have an eating issue and I can't control it. Um, and I was like, I think I just need somebody to talk to. Like, I don't think I need antidepressants. Again, my family not being educated. Now, freely, my sister kind of intervened and was like, no, you you genuinely do not need antidepressants. Like, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just, mm. you have an issue with food, basically. So I was like, I remember getting the prescription and I was like hell no am I going on that and there's nothing wrong with antidepressants before anybody thinks that I am slating them or saying that there is there is a time and a place but when I knew like when I knew wholeheartedly even being in such a dark place that I only needed someone to talk to or I only needed somebody to help me I knew that that wasn't the right decision for me basically um so depression is multifactorial at the end of the day so you know that will work for some people but for some people it's it's about that connection for some people it's about Mm -hmm. you know learning to regulate their body healing from trauma etc etc so you know just to to add that i suppose it's not that you're bashing antidepressants it's that you're there's this new wave that is looking at depression and mental illness in a new light so it is important to acknowledge that it isn't a fix-all and it isn't the only thing that's going to help especially with eating disorders as well um but yeah sorry continue (laughs) yeah that's actually really interesting as well though because I always um I actually do forget that you've so much knowledge around like trauma and like regulating your emotions and all so you're probably like ping 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 in your head as (laughs) a 
Um, but yeah, so I think that was the moment that I decided when I was feeling so low that I was questioning life. I was like, okay, I need to do something about this. But it wasn't until a year later that I decided to do something. Mm. So because the binges kept going on and because I became a coach and stuff like that, I think that just intensified the thing of like, you need to really work on this. Um, and then obviously I was friends with Saz at the time and she was the first coach that I had ever followed that was putting out like all of this like mad information of like, you know, like, if you don't want to go to the gym, like sometimes you just don't have to go. And I was like, who is this bitch? I was like, <laughs> I've never seen a coach say this. I was like, I love her. Um, but she was just, Shout out to Saz. <laughs> yeah, she just completely stood out to me. I was like, wow. Um, and I remember obviously we became friends or whatever. And she was always like, she obviously could see it from a mile away that I was struggling. And she'd always just like, you know, pop me a message or like if I told her I was struggling with something, she'd always just give me some great advice. And I remember actually saying to Avian, Avian was obviously going through her photo shoot prep and stuff like that, but she knew I was struggling. She was like, you really need to stop with this other coach because it's it's not right for you and um, blah, blah, blah. And then obviously I was talking about probably starting with Saz and stuff. And I remember I just had a really low day. I think I just had a, a, a binge day and I, I literally just text Saz. And I was like, hey, do you have any room for me? Like, can you sort a girl out? Um, and yeah, and that was, I suppose, the moment that obviously decided it all for me. But as you can see, I was struggling for like, I was struggling for years, but I was mainly struggling. Like at one point when I was really, really low, that was when I decided, okay, I'm going to go to the doctor. I'm going to get some help and everything else. But then because COVID hit and everything calmed down, I felt like I didn't need the help. So it wasn't only until the binges kept reoccurring that I was like, okay, I need something else. I need to do something about this. So Isn't that funny how we, get to, we can feel like because things aren't that bad that we don't need support. Yeah. And I think people could listen to the likes of your story or my story and be like, well, I don't have an eating disorder. I don't really need to fix things, even yeah. though they're probably emotional eating or severely um, under eating and mm -hmm. then, you know, feeling the lack of energy in their life. So there is disordered eating. I think I've explained that before in the podcast that like there's the difference between an eating disorder and disordered eating. Mm -hmm. Both are not good, sis. Both are not good. Yeah. Um, and we want to be able to, you know, support both and obviously stop the disordered eating when it's at disordered eating so it doesn't escalate to an eating disorder which mm -hmm. obviously is again multifactorial there's a lot of different things that can influence or contribute to that um but i suppose what's really important to note is that how long it took you to get to a place of um i actually going to change this and that's such a common thing along this journey just just for anyone listening i suppose what can happen is the development of negative self-talk, the development of I'm doing this to myself, the development of I'm out of control, no one can help me, I can't help myself, I'm whatever, you know, this kind of ne next, I won't say next phase, but you know, there is a phase in that journey where you feel kind of that out of controlness, but you also feel like you're at a loss with yourself, you're disconnected from yourself, you're disconnected from mm -hmm. your body. And to kind of move yourself on to the next stage of your journey which is to release the control to trust yourself to possibly gain weight that's a really fucking scary thing to do because yeah. it's like a massive jump from that place of you know feeling like you hate yourself feeling like you cannot do anything you've no confidence you've no like i said you've no trust you know sense of self like if your identity was being the lean girl and suddenly that's not your identity anymore where the fuck do you go next who yeah. the like you know that's just a whole other thing that makes you feel even further out of control so i suppose like did you was it with sarah that or oh, sarah <laughs> Saz, <laughs> was it with Saz that you like slowly but surely worked on it and slowly but surely learned to kind of trust that new way of eating that new way of healing your relationship with food that it wasn't as scary that it wasn't as i'm out of control as i thought it would be if i prioritize eating some carbohydrates and stuff or was it a case of like one day you were like it clicked and I'm gonna do this um no I felt like at the start it was definitely like it definitely a journey so um again backtracking on myself but just before I had started with Saz because I was coaching I actually had enough money at this point because I was working in pennies at the same time but I was also coaching so I was like I'm gonna just pay for private um therapy 
So I actually started the therapy before I had started with SAS. And it was obviously exactly what you were talking about, which I find fascinating. It's like, you know, just completely like think of how disconnected I was from my body to completely ignore what, like four years of science to not be connected to who I am as a as, as a human being at all to know like what's right for me what like what decision do I need to make next and just having like I suppose autonomy over my own body like it wasn't that was like everything I'd done was never really a decision I wanted to make it was it was made never taught to us though yeah like the, yeah I suppose you're saying, it took me four years to tune into that no one teaches you this shit <laughs> yeah. absolutely no one no one teaches you this shit until the likes of myself yourself and SAS are starting to be this new wave of coaches that actually educate on this stuff. So I suppose, yeah, it was four years, but was it actually four years? Because maybe it wasn't until your third year or your fourth year that you actually started to learn, mm, I'm probably doing something I shouldn't be doing here, you know? Yeah, yeah that's actually, it, it's a nice way, obviously, to, to put it and, you know, to frame it like that. But yeah, so it was therapy and then it was SAS and then SAS, like alongside working with, my emotions because obviously I was at like people are listening to this and probably like oh she's at the severe end I'm not at this end and stuff like that but you do not have to be at my end you do not like exactly like you said it could just be disorderly eating could be that you're just like you know you're really really emotionally eating um and once I got like into therapy and understood my emotions and kind of understood the root of it and then obviously having SAS then a couple of months later come in and be like okay, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. We're going to like, you know, challenge your food rules. We're going to have certain foods to eat and everything else. It was all so scary. And we laugh about it so much now, but I remember actually having like a full on fight with her because she wants me to take off my watch. <laughs> and I was like, no, Saz, I can't, like, I cannot do that. I cannot do that. And she was like, literally made me take off the watch. She was like, you have to hide it and everything else. But like, I was still so skitty at the time that I was like, my friends, I remember being out with one of the girls Sinead actually I was out with Sinead and we were running or whatever and I was like wait how many steps are you on then because like we've done the same distance so I'll be on the same steps amount the same step same steps as you so I was still obviously had my bits at the start um with Saz but like taking the watch off challenging certain food rules was definitely a process for me like it didn't feel like it clicked but it's almost like the way I describe it to girls now who come to me who want to work on their relationship with food it's like almost when you're you know when someone actually sees you so Saz seen me and obviously acknowledged me and I think just being seen and having that like you know that security that I haven't had in years where it's like no somebody's actually telling me that I can go and have these foods that's that to me I find that it, it it's very warm and it's very it's very loving and um, even though it's a coach and it's your coach and you know you don't expect to have that relationship but when somebody like I think people in life are just looking for security. We love a bit of security. We love feeling safe. So Saz being like to me, no, you can have these foods and you can have dinners that are over 600 calories and stuff like that. And it's okay. It was like, it couldn't like even just a month of that, I was like, then I had the click moment that was like, oh my God, I can have these and it's okay. You know, and I, I stopped, I suppose, like documenting, taking pictures of myself, just anything that, you know, would make me kind of doubt my journey. So like a lot of people will struggle exactly what you mentioned with like weight gain and, you know, allowing yourself to, you know, it's scary being able to, you know, work in your relationship with food and feel like you're going to gain weight at the same time. So most people won't do it because they don't want that. But for me, yes, my body changed. There was maybe probably I did gain a couple of pounds and stuff from just eating probably some days more, some days less, you know, some probably I did. But the main thing was, is that I wasn't really focusing on that. And like I had mentioned at the start of this podcast was that like, I was willing to pay the price. But by the time I got around to SAS, I was not willing to pay that price anymore. The price of my mental health, my well-being, my, you know, my emotional fucking well-being, like it was just way too high. So I was no longer going to pay that. And to me, it didn't matter if, okay, you have to put on a couple of pounds. I just removed anything that stressed that, like that reinforced that idea to me. So like taking photos of myself, you know, like taking underwear photos. And I know like I'm all for like, you know, being proud of the body that you're in and stuff like that. But I knew that that was not right for me. And that would have made me question my journey more so than anything else. Um, I suppose it also helped that I didn't have to do weight. I didn't have to do photos. I never had to do measurements with SAS. It was all about my relationship with food. 
Yeah, you removed your tools that can enable that control for you. But most importantly, in that moment, you felt safe to do so first. And Mm. I think what a lot of people fail to do is regulate their body first. And that's where having a coach, having a therapist, fucking Mm. doing meditation, yoga, slowing down, all of these things can really help you on that journey. So like you didn't just one day be like, okay, I'm just going to stop weighing like weighing everything doing the body check and blah 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 you had that sense of safety in your body first which is regulation first and then you can actually access the part of your brain that helps you think properly and it's not so emotional and it's not so you know you don't attach your self-worth to everything it's so 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 important that it's like safety for in your body first and we we feel unsafe in our body because of these myths because of these beliefs because that we've developed along the way of like you know, if I'm not in the lean body, it's unsafe. Um, if I'm not um, the person that's getting X amount of likes on Instagram, um, I'm unsafe. You know, these kind of things that need to be challenged, but you need to actually release and let go first. And that's the fucking scary thing. But yeah. I suppose if you think about what I've been saying, what's been coming up with clients recently is the kind of top down versus bottom up. Um, so basically what we try to do is control with our thoughts control with our mind i suppose if you think about it like we're like we are our thoughts obviously we're not but this is how people think um that we're like okay i'm thinking with my thoughts i'm going to control what my thoughts i'm going to stop stressing with my thoughts i'm going to make myself you know calm myself down by by thinking and sometimes that makes it worse um obviously in your situation and my situation as well um you were thinking to get the situation under control to feel relaxed you know you do xyz body check and whatever what, what actually can help people moving forward is the bottom up approach, which is regulating your body first, and then you can actually calm the mind, then you can actually bring the mind on board with the body as well. Um, at what point, or did you, did you at any point be like, I wanna get my period back, or was that just something that happened along the way? Um, yeah, no, there, there was definitely a point of that because when I realized it obviously wasn't normal, and I was like, oh my God, I don't have a cycle and stuff like that for me it was genuinely and it sounds bizarre because even when I was binging I wasn't safe in my own body and usually you know you have to get people to a safe place or out of fight or fly and you know maybe putting on a bit of body weight depending on depending on how lean the person is or whatever like for me it genuine all it really took was for me to put on some body weight like that's how lean I was I was so lean that you know my body actually didn't feel obviously safe enough to have a period so the more that I put on body weight, even th- even though it was true binging and stuff like that, I think almost the safer my body felt, even though it was still super stressed out at the time. So I know usually it's like, okay, help people obviously manage their stressors, reduce their stressors, but like everybody is so different. So what worked for me of just putting on body weight mightn't work for you know a client that you're working with or a client that I'm working with it could be that they actually have to manage their stress at the same time and they also have to put on body weight or they you know they don't or whatever so yeah for me it was just the more that I actually put on um body weight I just body fat I'm gonna say actually sorry I don't know what I keep saying body weight. um so body sorry. fat I my cycle eventually just came back but no, I didn't like, I didn't actually make, you know, the way like people would probably come to you and they, they're they like, I want to work on my cycle. I didn't make that conscious decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that that's really common. I think that's only starting to happen recently um, because I do be really surprised how educated people are coming to me already um, yeah. in the past, I would say only six months or so. Now, don't get me wrong. I've had some clients along the way, obviously that have been really educated, but some in previous times it had been on an initial consultation that I'm like do you realize xyz and we'd have to kind of you know get to the point eventually but now they're actually coming to me with these goals of I actually want to improve my relationship with food I actually want to feel better in my body I actually want to feel like I don't have to control what calories I actually want to feel grounded I want to have good digestive system and it's like yes fucking queens we're changing (laughs) the world we're seeing this shit trickle out that people are coming to me with these goals and by the way that's not to say if you are still hanging on to kind of losing weight being lean um you know wanting to be able to count calories and stuff like that there's nothing wrong with that as well like obviously you like like I said at the start of this podcast health first and health can include you know losing a bit of body fat if that's what's going to be appropriate for you 
uh, at the same time as supporting your digestive system and your hormones etc there's just obviously ways to do it that isn't so restrictive isn't so detrimental to your health and isn't an eating disorder like myself and Kira. <laughs> but um i suppose did you use any tools along the way that helped you um like did you do any like meditation or yoga or journaling or anything like that um, yeah journaling was definitely a big one for me so that was actually there was a lot of boundaries put in place with therapy as well so like therapy for me gave me a lot of tools so the main one was boundaries was like people pleasing was constantly saying yeah and it's to me it's so fascinating like on a day-to-day basis even working with clients I constantly learn new things about relationships with food and stuff like that and how it's not just one thing you know so we can't just say oh it was because I wanted to be skinny there were so many things that came into play you know my self-worth self-love boundaries you know even with my friends even with my family you know not having decent boundaries like played obviously a massive part so that was like one of the first things was one of the tools and anyways was just literally imagining that there was like I don't know like a fence wall around me and just every time I was having a kind of a a not so great time it was like kind of everybody had to kind of be pushed outside of those boundaries and I needed to just take time for me and I thought that was such a I suppose that was the first time I'd ever been educated around it but it worked so much like every time I felt myself you know saying yeah constantly you know putting myself out and just making everybody else happy I just had to push everybody out behind that wall and then I was safe again and I thought that was a really obviously nice way to think of things then I obviously started journaling as well and that helped massively like I couldn't I couldn't encourage someone to journal enough because I'm like it's you don't have to pay for it it's the best self-awareness tool ever and you learn so much about yourself we you love know? journaling queen yeah. <laughs> love journaling. I love that analogy um with the or not analogy whatever it is that vision of yeah. putting the wall up with the boundaries like that's a really important part of your healing journey with your relationship with food eating disorders anything like that any sort of relationship issues or anything that you want to deal with yourself that involves um deep healing i suppose you do need to have that space where you protect your energy and if you're like i suppose it's the whole situation of fill your cup up you need to yeah. fill your own cup up first before you give it out to other people and if in that situation you were so overwhelmed you weren't going to be able to give your best to people so what's the point anyways you probably could have reacted irritably you know um, yeah. or shut people down and that could have caused a fight in itself so it's really about protecting yourself first and not being afraid to do that um so i remember i heard on your podcast i think it was that you would have done a period of time where you were like you know what i'm just going to take this time separate myself from people stop going to social occasions and really just focus on me um how long would you say you would have done that for um i actually don't think it was i don't think it was that long but i think i more so with the boundaries it was like if it's not a hell yes it's a no so that's kind of another one that I use is like, you know, if even if a friend asked me for coffee and I know it's so simple, sometimes you need those, but sometimes you don't. And I always think in my head, if if there's even one thread of doubt of going out for that coffee, then it's a no. Because there's I'm not I'm not supposed to is basically how I look at it. And I think it's a great way. I think so many times we talk ourselves into doing things that we don't want to do. And it's like if you have to talk yourself into doing something, you should be saying no you should be 100% saying no um so I think it was only like a a couple of months that I kind of like I suppose separated myself from I suppose everything um now it's not like I lost anything or I didn't lose any friendships or whatever I still kept in contact but it was like I just stopped doing things that didn't actually serve me and that I realized I was only doing because I felt bad or I I, I didn't know how to say no anymore Mm -hmm. Um, so I think once you do that I don't know you realize what you like in life as well and what you don't like yeah, like you're just more it. intentional you're much yeah. more intentional with your energy you're much more intentional with who you surround yourself with and that's I think that's the fucking best way to live your life not living your life I, I love that as well I once heard that if it's not a fuck yes it's a no and I, that I was like fuck yes this I love that one liner I actually you've actually just reminded me that I started off the year saying that and now we've we've kind of lost track on along the way so maybe that's my affirmation for 2023 there you go we'll put it back in um yeah I lose sight of that as well so we all do yeah 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 and just before we finish up I suppose your 
journey then getting back to like exercise and stuff like that was that something that you ever had a pause on or was that something that you were like okay I'll pull back on or I'll lower the frequency or whatever yeah so I think in and around the time that we were challenging the food rules and we were doing all of that we pulled back on the steps and by we I sorry I mean Saz as well um but we pulled back on the steps you know stopped feeling like I, I used to be doing 20,000 steps a day so we stopped doing all of that um and we also stopped like you know overtraining as such calmed everything down and then I think it was only like months in that I was like okay I actually think I need to change from like you know your typical bodybuilding style training went into CrossFit and I think all of these things combined so therapy challenging food rules taking the watch off and then eventually starting CrossFit like CrossFit is such a it's a like it doesn't focus on how you look it focuses on how you perform and sometimes that helps people with like their food relationship is actually switching from okay we're going to eat this food to then equals how we look whereas in CrossFit it's like you need to eat in order to perform so sometimes changing people's eating in that sense to you know we have to eat now to be able to perform to show up for yourself to be as fit and as strong as you want so that definitely helped um I think alongside the journey but yeah we had to pull it back at the start because I was just way overdoing it overshooting um and then we eventually got back into training and now we're loving it. Love that for you. Um, yeah. I do just have to mention just with CrossFit, that, so that's amazing that that worked for you, that you shifted that mindset yeah. around your training. And that's such an important thing is like why you train, like evaluate why you train. If you're dragging your heels to a fucking session or you're feeling guilty because you skipped it, are you doing the right training for you? But I will say about CrossFit, I have seen both. I have seen where people do switch to towards performance and feeling good in their body. Yeah. But some people will use CrossFit as a almost another way to control or strive, achieve, you know. So it is important to note that some people will do CrossFit and will not match the calorie output. So at the same time, you were increasing your calories, you know, you were working on muscle gain, working on performance, where some people won't match the calories with that. And they will just, it'll just be another outlet basically to over exercise and under eat. Yeah, literally, literally. That is awesome. Yeah, anyways, calories, calories, calories. Um, you'll see that here a little bit on Bali where it's like the calories on the walls of things, you know, all these old fashioned slogans that we would have probably lived by um, and eat, train, sleep, repeat, whatever the fuck. And it's just like, Jesus Christ. But anyway. <laughs> but thank you, thank Sorry, you so much for coming on. Um, can you tell people where they can find you? Yes, yeah, so you can find me at Kira O'Connor Coaching um, on Instagram or my website is kiraoconnor.ie. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kira. Go give Kira some love. She's so knowledgeable. And like I said, she's so authentic, so vulnerable. Um, and just a sound fucking gal, which we love as well. We love realness on Instagram and TikTok as well. Your TikTok's brilliant. Um, I'm only recently starting TikTok. So, but Kira's is really good. And you're really good at like, I suppose, those point of view um kind of ways of showing people how disordered eating can show up in their lives um, and like the specifics of it how people might not even realize that it's disordered eating you know so yeah if you found this episode helpful do share it on with a friend any ratings or reviews are very much welcomed and appreciated on the podcast but yeah go give care some love and we'll see you next episode thank you <laughs>